Hi, it's Rob, and I'm being interviewed again. Apparently, it's going to be personal questions again, so a bit of a treat, or not. Um, but I'd like to hand over to you. We're recording for your podcast. Yep. So if you could share to everyone who's live what your podcast is, um, and then I'm just all yours. Uh, whatever you want, let you see, we've got all the gear. Yeah, no yeah. expense spare. <laughs> Yeah. Take Great. Uh, well, my name is Kate, for those of you that don't know me, and I work alongside Carl, who I'll let him introduce himself in a moment, and we are from Horton Implants. Uh, implants being? Dental. <laughs> <laughs> I made that mistake, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you were, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah. And uh, what podcast are we doing today, then? It's called Oral Bites. Um, so we interview people, get their stories. Do my teeth um, look good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit about teeth, but generally, uh, it's just basically people's stories. Yeah. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, okay. Just get get people heard. Um, yeah. yeah. All right, more yours. Fire Excellent. away. I should let you know, first of all, Rob Moore, that I am a podcast virgin, so you have got to go very gentle with me. Okay. Very gentle. I have taken your po- podcast virginity. You have. Ooh. You have. On the 25th of June. Wow. All right. <laughs> um, so, Rob, you are a multimillionaire, an extremely successful property investor, uh, extremely successful author, a father... And extremely good looking. Well, that was coming. <laughs> you have been told today, so I will give you that. So you're a very, very busy man, and we both want to thank you. Uh, we've got a small amount of protected time with you today. My so pleasure. We do want to say thank you. Yeah. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, I want to dive straight in, if that's okay. Um, you mentioned on one of the uh, mastermind sessions that you had um, a hole to fill. Now, given all the things that I've just said that you do, and you do a shed load more, what, in what form can that hole be filled? For me, I feel I can relate to that comment, and that's why it's so poignant to me, because I feel like I've got a little hole. And for me, I think fulfilling that would come in the form of helping people. But I think that's because of the work we do. Yeah. So it's natural for me, I think that's... What would fill that void for okay. you? What, what could that be? Right. So I've done a lot of research and work on this. And um, I believe that we're all looking to fill our voids. If we didn't have voids, we wouldn't have drives. Um, the study of axiology is the study of value, values. And often your values are linked to your voids. I, what's most important to you in your life is what you're trying to fill. And that can change. So let's say you have a um, a really bad business venture or your career goes a bit off track and you were comfortable, so money was good, so maybe um, that was full, so you focus more on family and um, holidays and stuff, and then all of a sudden money was a real struggle. That would become a void, and then that could become a value to fill that void. That's why people sort of diet, diet, get good, get in a relationship, get comfortable, put on weight, diet, put on weight, diet, put on weight. Because once the void is filled, the drive is no longer there. So I don't see it as a bad thing that we have voids that we're trying to fill, whereas I think a lot of society feels like there's something wrong with us. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, we're all perfectly imperfect. Um, Now, I think for some people, they have voids, they fill them, they move on. But for me, I've had one big void in my whole life, which is almost like a bottomless pit, which is a strength and a weakness. And that is the desire to be liked, appreciated, respected, noticed, to feel important, to feel valued, to feel like I'm giving value, which are all linked. Sometimes it's even to be loved. Um, And that came from when I was a really overweight kid, uh, when I didn't feel like I got that. And there was such emotional events around that for me, some bullying, a lot of shame and embarrassment, that it created such a strong void that no matter what I've done in my life, lost weight, become successful in certain things, that void has just always been there. And I always felt like something was wrong with me. Um, And like it's bad to want attention and admiration and respect, to want to be noticed and um, just someone who's valued. And I felt like that was a needy weakness in me. And then I realised, well, that's why I'm writing my books and that's why I'm doing the podcasts and, you know, that's why I'm building the communities and that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And there's great gifts that come from that, the help that I give to other people, the 
brand that I've created, obviously the money that follows. So that's like my superpower and my kryptonite all at the same time. So it gives you strength. Yeah. It pushes you on. It does, but it's, it, it's, it's never full. So you can feel great and then empty pretty quickly. Um, I just did an event at Expert Empires, and I'm a very experienced speaker. I've done 12 or 1,300 events, and I'm pretty good, if you don't mind saying. You know, and, um, I still wanted and needed to be the best speaker at that event, and um, so I was going around asking everyone did they think I was good. <laughs> Please say. And um, there was a, a poll on who the best speaker was, and I was the best speaker by quite some way, and um, that made me feel really good. And I, I, there was almost a need there. But it's weird because when you've done 12 or 1300 speeches and you, you know what you can do, that shouldn't matter. It doesn't really matter if I'm voted better by everyone else, but I'm honest enough to go, that made me feel good. But that was a driver to make a good speech and to deliver good value. And one of the things that was said was I gave more content and a lot of content. And so my need to deliver value and feel valued drives me to give more content, which drives good value. So like the, my own weaknesses drive the value that I create. So um, writing the books and doing the courses and everything I do, the reason that the quality of them is so good is also because of my own needs. Mm. And so I think if you can fulfill your own needs through your products and services, weaknesses and strengths, I think that's a great gift. And um, I think I've, over the years, found that I've learned more about myself and been more open about that and probably only really had a proper, a proper epiphany about that maybe in the last year. Mm enough to be open about it. I've always said I want to be successful, you know, I've always said I want to be um, known to be good, but I've never really said that I, I, I need to be liked and respected and valued. Um, and I think me saying that maybe gives other people permission to seek that as well. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Like sometimes I just have to go and ask for it. Yeah. Uh, come in from an event and I'll say to my wife, Oh, will you will you ask me how the event went yeah. so I can just tell how good it was so she can tell me that I'm good yeah. Yeah. and like sometimes you just have to ask for it because you know what it could be like because you know, this is business staff but relationships as well and um, yeah sometimes the need is so good that uh, sorry so great that I just stop messing around to go ask for it did you think it was good yeah great Whoa, I feel great thanks so yeah. with you saying that you crave and you like um, good feedback and, and different things like that and to be liked how do you feel when you get that negative feedback mm. you shared with us in the last group about somebody um, giving you um, a bad uh, review with one of your books so oh, I've had plenty of those okay so I just sort of I won't correct you but I'll just make it more technical you said need to be liked it's way more complicated than that it's not just liked I don't need to be liked by everyone I want to be respected by some liked by others, valued by everyone, admired by some, and loved by some. Yes. So it's quite, it's a bit more deep than just liked by everyone. I actually don't need to be liked by everyone, and I'm quite happy not to be liked by a lot of people. And this leads to the answer to your question, which is, I know if I want to be big, I know if I want to do my life's work and my mission, I'm going to have to collect plenty of haters. And so I accept that. Obviously, I'd rather not have that, but that's the way it works. I accept that. And so therefore, I'm quite happy to have some. And so how I deal with it is, one, it's all part of the game. More haters, more fans. Now, I don't try and get haters, um, but I know when I get them, I'm probably getting a 10 to 1 or 100 to 1 ratio of fans. So one hater must have 100 new fans. Um, the next thing is, if I have them, I'm sort of taking them from other people, and I actually quite like that responsibility. So like, I get more than my business partner, Mark, because I put myself out there more. And quite a lot of people go, well... Rob's the gobby one, Mark's the smart one. And I quite like when they say that because it, I like protecting him. Um, just like I like protecting my wife. She's never public on any of this stuff and I do all that. And, and that, that makes me feel valued. And, 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 and that's good. And, you know, like I don't mind if they don't really know what I've got or, or if I'm smart or not. Um, sometimes it can break through your wall. Like my wall has thickened and toughened significantly as I've grown because I've, like stuff that used to hurt me 10 years ago just makes me laugh now. Um, you know, if Rob was a cake, he'd eat himself. That was one of my reviews. And like, I just, that would have made me upset before. It was fucking brilliant. That's poetry. Am, am I allowed to, what's the language You're thing? Right. Okay. You're right. um, so like if I was a cake, I would eat myself. I would lick myself all over <laughs> and I would enjoy it and I'd get my haters to watch it. So, um, 
So I just think a lot of them are funny now. And I know that it's not me, it's them. Because if they don't know me, how can it be me? All that's happened is my ginger beard and my big chin has got in their face when they're a bit, they hate themselves and their life and I've picked a scab on them. It's nothing to do with me. Oh, he's one of those kind of guys. Well, actually, you don't know me. Oh, well, he does this. Well, actually, you don't know what I do. Um, so, yeah. It, so how do I deal with haters? Like, it's part of the game. I'm grateful for them. You need them. If I want to be big, I've got to collect more. And, I've just, and it's just a, a way. It keeps me humble. It keeps me grounded. It keeps me learning, developing and growing. Your critics actually serve you very well because you'll get your feedback from them, not from your fans. Yeah. You mentioned your um, weight a moment ago. And you used the word bullying, so you were bullied uh, as a child. I'm sure that you can remember how that made you feel, as if it was yesterday. Do you think that that's helped you, in a way, be the person you are today? Yeah, I think that um, if you want to become independent, successful, gritty, resilient, all these things, you have to go through challenge. Mm. And um, sometimes I feel sorry for people who haven't much. They've been protected or mollycoddled or whatever because th th they will revo revert to um, dependent tendencies. Oh, mummy, daddy, help me. Oh, someone will come bail me out. Oh, I'm a victim. My life is unfair. So, you know, your challenge develops your character. I hated it when it happened. And I've got lots of things that happened. Not really extreme abuse, but for me, it was all in my head. But it was still in my head. It was still real to me. Um, and that they burnt so deep into my soul that they're, they're definitely still there a lot. Um, but I am who I am through the experiences I've had and all the parts of myself I like. You could probably link back to that. Some of the parts of myself I don't like, you could probably also link back to that. Um, but yeah, the void that's never full, I think, definitely um, is, is from that. And um, because I have this constant need to prove myself, my work is never done. I've just written, I'm just written my 15th book, it's just gone live. My 16th book will be written in five weeks. That's all from um, my work is never done because I'm never finished, because I'm never enough. But if that puts good work out to the world, then that's a gift. And that's just what I'll always have to deal with. I'll always have to deal with never quite feeling content. Have you ever come across, I mean, I know you, 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 it's a big world, but have you ever come across um, some of the bullies since? Have they ever crossed your path? The thing with the bullies is they weren't, my bullies weren't bullies. Like, they were just other kids at school that called me a fat fucker because it was funny to them. So I, there's not like one person who really abused me, like maybe other people got. It was just, I was the fattest kid in the year. So that, that I was the butt of all the jokes. Um, I've actually met two or three guys that, I, I, a lot of them were actually my friends. I was friendly with them, but then they'd say stuff about me. Um, and a lot of them were like, I don't even remember. They probably didn't even know what they were doing. Yeah. You know, you're a kid, you, you say what you say, you don't know how it hurts someone. Yeah. And by the way, I'm not the only person, I'm not playing a violin about this, there's people who've had it worse than me. There's people who've got disability, there's people who are the only black kid in school, you know, there are people the only gay person in school, that must have been way fucking harder. Mm. But I was the fattest kid in school, so I've got my own version of that story. But a lot of it wasn't a real torture. It was what I thought they were saying and doing in my head. But things like showering in school and swimming in school, uh, ho horrible, horrible. Yeah, the rugby shirt that I couldn't get on. I, they, I could never fit into the rugby shirt because they never made them big enough. And just the rolls. And then they're all laughing at me. And they, they're, they're just kids. They're not thinking I'm ruining this guy's life. They're just laughing at me because it's funny. But I couldn't see the funny side of it. And things like that I would be better at now. I think a key... To, to balancing this void, we're talking about me, but everyone's got their own, is actually a lot of things now, okay, they might hit me at a spot, but I don't take it too seriously anymore. You say something, I'll laugh with you. You know, something happens, oh, well, whatever, I am me, this is me, this is who I am. And I think the more you know yourself and the more comfortable you are in your own skin, I'm way more comfortable with my flaws now than I was, because I think, because the flaws and the strengths are linked. So I, could, I shrug a lot of this stuff off and I take things a lot less personally now. I think that's really mm. Definitely the best way. Mm. You mentioned your dad 
Um, you mentioned your dad uh, a lot, um, and I know you want to talk about um, this as well. Yeah, I mean, I, it's different, but it's similar in that my dad was um, alcoholic in the end, um, suffered with a bit of depression, and that that was hard for me at times, really mm. hard. Um, and you've come in and you've talked to us, I think it was the very first day we met, and he was going through a really, really bad time. Mm. Um, so the depression was quite bad for him. But you still turned up, mm. and you, you still came in, and you still looked after everybody that day. Yeah. How do you get that strength? Um, for me, I'm talking personally for me, actually doing that helps. Sometimes yeah. when you're going in and you, you're going back to work or, or you're talking about things, it, it helps a little bit. Yeah. But it's hard. Yeah. Um, so for me, there's a few things at play here. Yeah. Number one is I've got a job to do and I'm going to get the job done. Yeah. Um, and I don't like letting people down. Yeah. I'm not saying I haven't, but I don't like it. Um, that's one. Number two is I think similar maybe like me. Work is therapy for me a lot of the time. It's therapy from my demons. It's therapy from shit that's going on in your life. Yeah. It's convenient distraction. And so it helps me go through dark or darker or lonely times. I'm not saying that's right for everyone, by the way. Some people, it's not right. But for me, it is. And work is the greatest therapy. Um, so that's the second thing. And I believe people in the world judge you, not in the easy moments, but in the hard moments. Um, so I gave you a couple of examples because I was asked at the Forex Marketing Mastermind. Um, someone messaged me and their son's really struggling he's got yeah. learning difficulties and disabilities and his dream is to be driven up to school in a, a nice car and I've got a Lamborghini Aventador and they reached out a bit of an off chance um, and I agreed and some of the guys in the office wanted to do a social media video on that and I said I don't want to do that I just want to do it to help the person I don't want to use it as a marketing angle because I just want to do something good and um Ed Milet, who I interviewed on my podcast, he found out that his dad had just got a really nasty strain of cancer the day of the podcast interview, but he still turned up and did it. And that's what I would do. And I really admired that about that guy. He had every reason to cancel me two hours before, and that would have inconvenienced me. And he would have had the best excuse and I would have been absolutely fine with it. But he still did it. And that's how I want to be known. I mean, we do 850 events a year. And I don't think I've cancelled. I can't remember when we've cancelled an event. Even if, you know, even if it would lose us money, we don't cancel events. We, you know, we don't let people down. Um, not saying we're perfect. You know, we yeah. certainly make mistakes. But um, it's in those moments, I think, that you're really being judged. And no one has to see. It's what you do when people aren't watching. Um, so, yeah, they're the reasons why I think when things are harder in my life I still just want to crack on and get stuff done that could be a weakness as well because I'll be at work at my own funeral probably as the kind of person I am but because it serves me on a my own personal therapy basis as well like when I've been single and lonely or when I've you know I mean going through a hard time in a relationship I just go and work and it distracts me but maybe I don't grieve properly I don't know um, that's quite complicated. I'm not sure how good a griever I am. I've not had a huge amount of death trauma in my life. I tend to just get on with it. Um, and there, there, there could probably be some weaknesses in that as well, or that could build up. I don't know. But, you know, I'll, I'll find out. Well, I know you love counselling and all that. Yeah, <laughs> counselling, yeah. I need yeah. therapy like shit. Yeah. 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 And you're into all your yoga and everything. Yeah, yeah. right, yeah. Come on, is this called the Hippie Podcast? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're going to change it. Yeah. Rob, you came into uh, one of the masterminds. You'd come in from a break, and um, I picked up that you you weren't very happy. For whatever reason, momentarily, whatever happened in that break, and I know you, you're busy because you have meetings. Now, you normally pick up on things like this I do, yeah. really, really quickly. And I noticed straight away that you didn't see yourself. But literally, within minutes... You, you were straight back into Rob Moore and doing exactly what you do. How do you how do you manage that if you've got irritated? How do you manage it when you've got a room full of people? How do you keep yourself together? Um, one is I've got a job to do, like I said before, yeah. and you guys have paid me money, so I take that really seriously. 
Um, and I wouldn't want anyone to feel like I'm distracted and not there in the room. So that's one. I think I've trained myself over the years to be able to turn the switches on and off because I have a lot going on in my day and I have to get in. I'm doing a podcast now. Obviously, we've just come out of a mastermind doing a podcast or do a one-to-one call. You know, I've, Kieran and I are going down and do two podcasts tomorrow. I'm seeing a TV production company. So the way my life has transpired in business is I'm doing a lot of different things. So I guess I've trained myself to be able to go... Psh, psh. It's a good trait. Yeah, I think, but it's, it's a good trait, but it's also, I can do that too much sometimes um, and can be a bit edgy. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's shit going on every day. Um, you know, thankfully, like I said, I've not had too much like full on life tra- trauma. I know it's coming and I'm scared of it. My dad's going to go one day and I'm really scared of that. And, you know, like, I try and live my life to make him proud. Um, but there's always shit going on in the background. There is. Do you not think he's proud? I think your dad's proud. Um, he's told me a couple of times and it's meant the world, but yeah. you know, like uh, he could be proud yesterday, but he could be more proud today. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess if there was massive trauma, it might stay on my head, in my head. But other than that, I think, you know, like there's always stuff going on in the background. So when there is, I think you can learn how to s- switch the gears. But whether it's public speaking or running a business or running masterminds or doing a podcast like this, the key is being present. And for me, being present is not that easy because I'm a goal oriented need to fill my void kind of person. So that's always looking in the future and sometimes looking in the past. And people live in the past a lot. I live in the future a lot. I live in the past a bit. But how many of us actually stay truly present? Well, that's why we do meditation. That's why we do yoga. That's, you know, this is a big thing now, mindfulness and all of that. And you know, in some ways it's a bit fluffy, but in other ways, like I don't re- do, I'm not mindful in what they'd say in a book. If they look at me and, you know, like one woman said to me when I came off stage, like the week, she said, Rob, that was a really good talk, but there is something missing in your life. I think, wait a minute, I'm going to get read by someone here. Love it when that happens. You lack spirituality in your life. You need to find spirituality. And when you do, you'll know exactly what it is and you'll be complete. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, so yeah, exactly. So in the classic sense, you wouldn't say I'm mindful. But, you know, I'm doing this podcast and until we've actually talked about this now, I haven't thought about not being mindful here. Even though if I thought about it, I know that I've got plenty of shit to do because I've been in a mastermind all day and there'll be a million emails and we've got to do the questions for tomorrow for Ollie because we haven't done them yet. I haven't looked at the questions for Theo yet. See what I mean? I could soon get straight back into yeah. Yeah. that. But, you know, you're very grateful to me for doing this, but you've joined my mastermind and you've travelled a long way to be here. So I'm as grateful to you as you are to me. And I think going into the mindset of service and gratitude... And knowing what my job is to give you a really good podcast. So if you drive home and go, that was a great podcast, that's the best job I can do. And I can only do that if I'm present. So in that regard, I think I can do that quite well. Not always. Like I'm, you know, at home, I'm often social media work and my wife's had to sort of say, come on, look, you know, get a bit more present. And she's right about that. Um, We can always do a bit more work on that. But being present in the moment. Yeah. 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 Have you done a dentist on your podcast yet? Mm, I don't think we've done a dentist on the okay, podcast. Okay. If we have a uh, void to fill, yeah, yeah, yeah. I noticed when you started with a hole to fill, I like your little, yeah, like, <laughs> like your little theme there. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, I mean, one of the things you, you, you cleverly avoided is how you feel um, with your dad. I mean, how, I mean, how does that feel? I know how it made me feel, and it, it, was, it was really upsetting. Yeah. Um, I find it really difficult to cope with it emotionally. Do you ever, you know, I mean, okay, another question maybe then, if I, if you don't want to talk about it. No, I don't, I don't mind. How do I feel it's complicated yeah. is the answer. Because on the one hand, I'm really, really fucking grateful he's still here yeah. because he's 76 years old and he's, he's had a life. Yeah. He's had a 200-year life in a 76-year-old body. How can I not feel grateful that he's here every day when people have had, I mean, s- someone spoke to me yesterday dad died at 36 you know like that just um so I feel really grateful every day I see him but then I also think I could spend more time with him and I feel some guilt around that 
Um, but I know that my dad would want me to do my mission, so I feel okay about that. Um, and of course, he doesn't really feel that he's going through a tough time because that's what bipolar is. Yep. I went to see him yesterday, good chat with him. How are you, Dad? Oh, I'm amazing, everything's great. He's in one of those highs. It's kind of mum that is harder for, much harder. Um, but we've all got shit going on. Mm-hmm. I don't get the violin out for myself. I, you know, you rarely hear me complain about the shit that's going on. And if I have a little bit of a pity party, I'll try and fix it really quick. Um, so... I probably don't let myself feel really upset about it because he's still here. Yeah. Um, If I think about it, I feel more upset for my mum, but she's a fighter. Um, Yeah. So I can't quite put into words how I feel about it. It's okay. Thank you. Yeah, but he's still here and I'm... And that's great. And, that, and that's great. Yeah. And the worst day of my life is going to be when he goes. I know yeah. it. And I know it's coming one day. Um, well, hopefully not. Yeah. Very soon. Or not, don't you? No, well, yeah. who knows? I, I yeah. feel very lucky that I've not experienced a lot of what people have. I mean, when I was at school, there was a really popular kid in the year below. It was called Marco Keane. And everyone liked him. He was really popular. He was good looking. The girls liked him. And... Um, it was just at the age where we started drinking, I think 13, 14, that kind of age. And people had gone out and got drunk and he went to creep into the um, the, the female halls of residence to go and be with the girls. And he climbed up a drain pipe and it snapped and he fell off and he died. And I just think, fuck, his parents, you know. And I think about things like that quite a lot. And there's a, I'm a very lucky person. So, so many people have had all sorts of shit happen. So I, I do feel that sense of, of gratitude and fortune as well. And I think that helps. Yeah. Mm. Um, Mark, your, your business partner, who we don't sort of see very much, very quiet, very different personalities. <laughs> but you seem to gel very, very well. And you speak to a, a bear him in such a high regard. How, I mean, I know I've read your book, so you know I know a little bit about how you first met, but... When you, when you first met, how quick was that relationship to develop? Was it like an instant click? or was No, it... I wouldn't say it was an instant click because we were different, yeah. but we were intrigued by each other, yeah. I think, because we were different. And it took us a little while to understand each other. It probably took us two years to understand each other because yeah. we were just so different. So no, it wasn't a romantic instant click. It was intrigue. And then that developed. And some of the holes he had, I filled and vice versa. And that was convenient. Um... And then I would say sort of three months in, we were like, we could do something here, you know, let's, let's get a couple of houses together. Um, and, and then it just progressively built over that time. Yeah. Mm. Like a little seed. Yeah, mm. yeah. I, I, you, there's, there's strength in history and time and things you've gone through together. And it's romantic to think that you instantly gel with people and it's like your long lost soulmate people I felt like that about in three months we're over whether it's romantically or partnership wise so um, sometimes it's good that it takes a bit of time and you're feeling each other out Mark's much more reserved and more sceptical than I so I was always push 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 I was banging on his door at six o'clock every morning let's go out for a run he used to go out for a run in his pants because he didn't have shorts (laughs) bloody waving everywhere (laughs) I know I know like Mark's Mark um, but he's re- he still runs to this day and running's a big part of his life so I added some value there yeah. um, so does he I, keep you grounded Rob? yeah he does he tells me off quite a lot and yeah just checks in and makes sure I'm not going completely off the rails but protects me in a lot of ways as well and does a lot of things for me behind the scenes that no one sees that I try and tell people because I'm really grateful for it um, he fixes out all my insurances that helps source all the life insurance policies, does all the restrictions, the charges, the contracts, the legals, all that stuff. That's really valuable, and that's stuff I'm not very good at. Um, yeah. So you complement each other then, really? Your strengths? Yeah, I think that, that's, why, that's why we're still in partnership. Mm. There's not much duplication. We're not getting in each other's way. There's trust, there's autonomy. There's, I'm getting X done, he's getting Y done. So there's leverage, there's all those things. Partnerships often go wrong because you're both doing the same thing. There's a clash. There's no leverage. Um, there's a power struggle. 
yeah, I'm not saying we don't have our moments, but there's none of that shit. Yeah. Mm. What do you see as, uh, I mean, we talked a little bit about your legacy in some of the Mass and I classes, but where, where do you see that being? What would you like it to be? I'd like to be remembered as a guy that um, got in your face and disrupted your thought processes and your comfort and maybe even you didn't like at first but got you to see that there was a bigger game that you could play in the world and then helped you play that bigger game that would be what I would like my legacy to be Um, and at the moment that's in the form of books and training events and stuff at the moment business personal development and property I have the feeling like it will go wider and wider and hopefully great greater impact and reach but you know like if, if everyone I reach says yeah Rob you're right yeah Rob you're right I'm not teaching them anything I'm only showing them what they already know yeah. and whilst that's nice the people who go yeah Rob at first you really ruffled my feathers but I get it now and I've made these changes and my life is better. And I get that, that, that feedback multiple times a day now. Um, so I'd say that's what I'd like my legacy to be. I'm, I'm much more clear on that now. 